Hello guys, David Vos here again, out here in Alabama, and it is summertime. It's so beautiful. Wow, there's flowers everywhere, and uh, just is amazing. I hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. Well, friends, I ain't going to waste any time jumping right into the meat of what we're going to discuss today, because it is imperative that we grasp this. This is one of these little things that if we can see this, it will literally open our hearts to some beautiful truth. But the problem is, as we've said, we're being lied to on every corner, in every direction, on all sides. We haven't got a chance because everything is a delusion. It is deception everywhere you look. The book that we read, whereby we have the testimony of Jesus Christ, that holy book is the very book that they're using to deceive your mind and bring you into bondage. Now, I'm not trying to tell you, friends, many of you Christians are going to turn on this and maybe for the first time and say, oh boy, this guy don't believe in the Bible. Friends, I believe in the Bible. I believe in the Holy Scriptures. I believe in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He was born on this earth as a human being. He died and was resurrected. He died for your sins. And it's a free gift for anyone who will receive it. But what I'm about to tell you is you're not going to ever be able to grasp the true gospel because of the fact that they have mistranslated it and lied and deceived in every religion, even the religions that are giving us the book and printing the book and translating the book called the Bible and putting it into our hands with a big smile. Of course, they also bring a little plate, right? They want you to drop some money in there too. But they're giving you this Bible and telling you it's the Word of God and at the same time deceiving and lying and making you twofold a child of hell. And let me tell you what I'm talking about. This Bible that we have has been so mistranslated and abused and interpreted falsely, turned upside down and backwards to such an extent that it's now almost impossible to find the gospel. So, let me show you here. Um, this is online etymology dictionary as regards the word pagan. 1400, perhaps mid 14th century, quote, person of non Christian or non Jewish faith, unquote. From late Latin, paganus, pagan. In classical Latin, villager, rustic, civilian, non combatant. What does that have to do with, with a non Christian? A villager. Okay. We're getting lies here friends let me show you something let me show you how they're deceiving you because this word's very important to the deception they want you to believe that a pagan is someone evil and a christian is something you should be well you know we're in christendom but not very many people i don't know of any actually that have actually ever explained or told the world or woke up and understood the great deception here. Because, you see, what they're doing is they're telling you the, the word pagan. What does pagan mean? And you're thinking, oh, well, pagan's in the Bible. So if pagan is bad, then something that, whatever that word is in our Bible, pagan, must be bad. So don't be a pagan, because obviously the Bible says don't be a pagan. Well, the Bible does not say don't be a pagan. The word pagan is Latin. The Bible has a different word. And we'll, we'll show what that word is here in a minute. So, that word in Hebrew, or there's another word in Greek, that they translate pagan in older Bibles, and sometimes heathen or, or something like this. 
And so we say, oh my goodness, we don't want to be a pagan. Well, the Jewish deity was a jealous deity. He didn't want you to worship anyone else, any other god. He said, I am God, there is none. I recognize no other. He didn't say there isn't any other. He said, these other gods don't follow them. I'm a jealous deity. I am the deity of vengeance. So, they start off to try and explain to you what this word in the Bible means, and they tell you what a Latin word means. And yes, there were translations that translated those words pagan, but this is going to get... Actually, this is very simple. I could just explain to you very easily the great deception here, but I want to read how they're doing it. I want you to see how vigorously they're trying to deceive you. So let me let me read on here. It says, From late Paganus, pagan in classical Latin, of the country of a village from Pagus. Country people, province, rural district. Oh, don't be a country person. Shouldn't be a country person, right? That would be ridiculous if the word meant a villager. The word pagan doesn't mean a villager, or does it? Well, then, there's got to be some kind of a mistranslation or misunderstanding here. So let's go on. Originally, district limited by markers, thus related to panjer, or to fix fasten from pie root pag to fasten as an adjective. See, really, this is all beside the point, because this is some Latin word. What we want to do is find out what the words in the Bible mean, because we're supposed to be following the Bible. But let me just show you how they carry off this deception. The religious sense often was said in the 19th century to derive from conservative rural adherence to the old gods after the Christianization of Roman towns and cities. So they want you to believe that if you're a pagan, you're not a Christian. But they're using a word that has nothing to do with anything. So it gets very convoluted. The Latin word in this sense predates the period in church history, and it's more likely derived from the use of paganus in Roman military jargon for civilian. Oh, so now it doesn't mean villager, but it's like a civilian. Incompetent soldier. Well, you definitely don't want to be an incompetent soldier if you're a Christian, because, uh, wait a minute, this is getting really convoluted, because Jesus said, don't be a soldier. Don't, don't, you know, turn the other cheek, right? How are you going to be a, a soldier in a war if you're supposed to turn the other cheek, if you're supposed to forgive your enemy, if you're not supposed to hate your enemy, you have to have love. Well, I love you, but I've got to kill you. Do you see how ridiculously upside down and backwards everything that we've been taught to believe is? Don't murder, but go and kill all the, the world and genocide the nations. <clears throat> and it starts with little mistranslations like this. And this is going to blow your mind when you find out what a, a real pagan is because most people today identify as Christian or they might say I'm Muslim or I'm something like that. But some nowadays, modern there's modern people out there saying, oh, I'm a pagan. And the church is like, oh my goodness. And even the pagans are dressing up like, like devil worshippers, thinking that pagan means a devil worshipper. Oh, don't be a pagan. That means you're a devil worshipper. And I'll, I will show you, friends, that it completely the opposite is true. That the pagans were the ones who were worshipping the true and living divine being. Let me show you this. So let's keep on here. It says, um, Christians picked up with the military imagery of the early church. See, they were adding illusions to the Bible. Making the Bible allude to military imagery. Uh, war efforts, and, and yet the, the Bible is about the complete opposite. Christianity is the complete opposite of what they're wanting you to, to believe it's about. The English word was used later in a narrow sense of one not a Christian, or a Jew, or a Muslim. So when people tell you, well, you're a pagan, they didn't consider you a pagan if you were Muslim if you were Jewish, if you were Christian, but if you were any other religion, well, now that might tell us a little bit about what kind of religion they would promote. They didn't mind if you were Islamic. Do you know that the Vatican, the Roman Church, created Islam? So, of course, they, would, they wouldn't uh, say that being 
a Muslim was being a pagan because the whole point of Christianity was that you were cursed, anathema. You were put to the stake. You were crucified. You were burned at the stake if you were a pagan. So they didn't crucify Muslims. They didn't crucify Jews or anyone who was a Catholic. Of course, if you were a Christian that didn't believe in their kind of Christianity, like a Protestant, they called themselves Christians. Or if you were a Gnostic, they called themselves Christians, you were still burned at the stake. It really had nothing. It was just a, a, a systematic deception aimed at lying and deceiving the entire world. So they say pagan and heathen are primarily the same in meaning. But pagan is sometimes distinctively applied to those nations that, although worshipping false gods, are more cultivated as the Greeks and Romans, and heathen to the uncivilized idolaters as the tribes of Africa. Oh, if you're from Africa, you're really bad. See, now you're worse than a pagan. Now you're a heathen. <clears throat> Much less a heathen. So the English surname Pain or Pain appears by old records to be from Latin Paganus, but whether in the sense of villager, rustic, or heathen is disputed. It also was common Christian name in the 13th century and was no doubt given without any thought of its meaning. I guess not. Heathen. Old English heathen. Not, not a Christian or a Jewish. Also a noun. Heathen man, one of a race or nation which does not acknowledge the God of the Bible. Well, see, they're completely making up a definition. Because probably when this word heathen was used, dark ages, whatever, a lot of those people weren't Christians in the first place. There might be druids, right? But <clears throat> yet they were still saying that if you were, um, you know, because this is talking about, these were old Norse words, heathen, heathen, it's from the, the old Norse, which were druidic religions. They were the pagans, right? According to them, they were the pagans. Well, in reality, these, um, Norse individuals weren't pagan. And we'll show you that here in a minute. But it says, the Proto-Germanic Heitana, which is uh, also of Old Saxon Hebden, Old Frisian Heathen, Dutch Haydn, Old High German Hedan, and German Haydn, which is of uncertain origin. So we're talking about Druids who had a word, a derogatory word, that spoke of someone else, that now is being used in the Bible to speak of the, the very same people that use the word to speak of the other people. They've switched it. They've, they've turned the tables. I'm a heathen. No, you're a heathen. No, you're a heathen. No, I'm a heathen. Nobody knows. What is a heathen? So it says, perhaps literally dweller on the heath, one inhabiting uncultivated land. This is ridiculous. This has nothing to do with whatever it is the Bible says you shouldn't be. Historically assumed to be ultimately from Gothic Hatno, Gentile heathen woman, used by Ufilus in the first translation of the Bible into the Germanic language, like other basic words for exclusively Christian ideas. <clears throat> so this goes on and on. They said, as you guys saw, they said that it, the word pagan just kind of means heathen. So what does the word heathen mean? Again, neither one of these words are Hebrew or Greek. But this old Norse word, heathen, what does it mean? The word heathen is an older translation of the Hebrew word goyim. Now we're getting somewhere. So it translates the Hebrew word goyim in the Old Testament. The word goyim literally meant nations. Ah, so now we see what the word means. It means a non-Jew. Has nothing to do with Christianity. So who really is Christianity? The Catholic Church said, don't be a heathen. You've got to be a Christian. But a Christian was considered a heathen to the Jews. Do you see what they've done here? So the word goyim literally meant nations and could refer broadly to all the nations of the world. And that is another lie. In uh, Genesis chapter 10, where it tells you about all the different children of Noah, 
and where they went. It starts off in chapter 10, verse 1, talking about the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 2 says, The sons of Japheth are Gomer and Magog, and it gives you the, the, the names of his children. And verse 5, it says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. And that word there is Goyim. So many have said that this word Goyim really refers to the children of Japheth. But whatever the case might be, it certainly has no evil connotation. It simply meant peoples, a certain group of peoples or nations. It had nothing to do with idolatry. It had nothing to do with evil. In fact, the word Goyim is also used for Jacob in the Bible. It just means a people or a nation. And Jacob was a people or Israel. They were a, a Goyim. So it's odd that Judeans would consider certain people Goyim in a derogatory way when the Bible itself calls the Judeans Goyim. When it says Isaac's wife Rebekah in her womb there were two Goyims or two nations Jacob and Esau. So Jacob was a Goyim and Esau was another Goyim or a people. So it certainly has no evil connotation. There are those that believe that the only true Goyim are the children of Japheth because there is a verse in the Old Testament that says that Shem's children will dwell in Japheth's house or they will dwell with the, the Goyim. Now, we've just done a whole series on both John, the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Peter talking about all the diaspora or the scattered Israel that were up in Europe. So, we'll talk more about that in, in another video. But I'm certainly, and I'm just making the point here, that Goyim is not a derogatory word whatsoever, and at times does apply even to the Judeans themselves. So, in Judaism, they forbade, or Yahweh forbade, any of Jew, the Judeans to follow after the gods of Japheth or the Goyim or the islands of the sea, the Druids, the people up in Europe or whatever that was that, that eventually found its way to that area. So the word now is getting so convoluted that we can barely keep up with it because first of all, the Christians were using it like they were Jews because the Jews used it, said don't be a Goyim. But the Jews call the Christians Goyim. Because they're actually in that area where the Goyim are. Didn't Paul go unto the Gentiles? Well, Paul didn't go unto all the world, did he? He only went to Europe. The Gentiles, the Goyim. Now, that does not mean that Christianity would not go to all the nations. Book of Revelation says it would go to every tribe, tongue, and people. And this is where we finally start to realize that the Bible is so convoluted and the lies are so thick that we can barely even follow it. And this is important, this word, and what I'm showing you. Not only am I showing you that the Bible cannot be understood presently the way it's translated, because they've lied and they've put Latin words that mean the opposite of what they actually are supposed to mean. But this is important specifically because we're being told on a regular basis, I mean for the last, I don't know how many hundreds of years, we've been told, do not be a pagan. The pagan is the worst thing you could ever be. And yet, if you're a Christian, you are a pagan. Because the gospel went unto the Gentile, or the pagans. And the Judeans rejected the gospel. So there are no Judeans that are Christians. All the Christians in the world, except for a few that have converted, but all of the Christians of the world are the pagans. The pagans are the true followers of Christ. Now, this has really, really helped to do, completely confuse the world and destroy our understanding in, in, in anything and divert us from the true deity and the true faith. Because we're so scared of this word that we and, and, and so convinced that you shouldn't be this 
that you've got people running around now dressing up like they're evil, like they're Satanists, claiming they're the pagans. And the church going, see, don't be a pagan. Well, then they say at the same time that you see these people running around with tattoos and they're all dark or gothic or something. But it was the goths that took over the church. The Visigoths. So here again is another backwards thing. Everything's upside down and backwards. It was the Goths that are the church. The Germanic Third Reich. And we will show that Germany embraced Christianity and forbade Hitler, forbade paganism. And to this day, you're not allowed to be pagan. And yet now they're encouraging it. Because of, you know, we've got to be free, right? You've got to be free to do whatever you want. So now you can be a pagan. But now they've changed the word of a pagan to a Satanist. So people are running around to get the children. Oh, I want to be a Satanist. Oh, I'm a pagan. And I don't believe in the Bible because the Bible says don't be a pagan. Well, the real thing that they're trying to cover up is the fact that we ought to be a pagan. That we are pagans. Pagan just means of Europe. Well, uh, people in Europe are pagans. Okay? The people who lived... Uh, well, most white-skinned pe people are pagans. By definition, they're not Jews. We're not Judeans. We don't have that blood. Now, we are of Israel, either from Judea through Zerah's line and not through Perah's line, or from the uh, children of Dan, or from Joseph, because they came over to America, and there are, all the, well, all the tribes of Israel have come to America, whether it's black, yellow, brown, or white, because Israel is all the nations of the world. And we've been proving that in many, many videos. So, the people of the divine being. In such cases, the heathen were non-Jewish idolaters who did not know the one true deity. Let me tell you something about the one true deity, friends. Christianity has been preaching for 2,000 years, well, for 1,500 years, that the one true deity is Jehovah. That is a Jewish deity. Christians don't worship that deity. This is another backwards thing. Jesus said to the Jews, the Sanhedrin, your father is the devil, a liar and a murderer. My father is above. Jesus was born of a virgin. He did not fulfill the prophecies of Moses that, 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 or, or the prophecies of the Old Testament, of Yahweh, that there would, they would, they would send his Messiah or anointed one that would be like a general that would wipe out the world and, and murder every man, woman, and child on the earth in the great day of Armageddon. Jesus said, you have one that condemns you, and that is Moses and the law. But I have come to give you life, and that more abundantly. I do not condemn you. I don't condemn the adulterer. Why don't you keep the Sabbath, Jesus? Because my father keeps working. He works on the Sabbath. I keep working. We don't rest. That's your father. So, In the New Testament, we have something different. The word Jehovah is never mentioned. What we have is, is something completely foreign to Judaism. We have a man who claim, claims to be divine, one with the Father. But the word Father is never used in the Old Testament. It's only because there is only one deity in the Old Testament, Yahweh. I mean, not the whole Old Testament. The, the Old Testament talks about the other deities, of course. And the El Elyon, the Most High, which is above Yahweh. But I'm saying the Judean religion only allowed you to worship the one deity. And he claimed to be the, the only one. He recognized no other. He was the Savior. So there wouldn't be any Jesus. And there wouldn't be any Father. Because why would you say Father of the deities? See, what does it mean, Father? Well, Dave, it means that we're all his children. Yeah, but Jesus said, ye are gods. And the scripture cannot be broken. We are the Elohim. That's why he's our Father. Because we're deities. Which is, again, something that Christianity today, modern Christianity, refuses to believe. But Jesus taught. So, when the New Testament talks about the divine one, it says that it is a father and a mother and a son. And we're all children. This is what the Trinity is. The Holy Spirit in almost every language is feminine. And goes back to the Hebrew Ruach, which is feminine. Who is called Sophia in the book of Proverbs chapter 8 as the architect of the universe, who was with the father, because she's the mother. And her son, 
they were, they were all there in the creation. And so were all of us as the children because it says we were in Christ from the founding of the world. And when the world was founded, it says all the children of God were there clapping their hands for joy. So the idea that this is that you're a pagan if you don't believe in the one deity, the one father, that's an interpolation. There was no father of the of the Judeans, just the one deity who said, I make evil and I make darkness and I am vengeance and don't touch my holy mountain. It's just on fire and quaking and smoke and gloom and thick darkness for I'll kill you instantly in my wrath. I will not pardon your sins under the third and the fourth generation. I will by no means pardon your sins. So it's a complete lie. Everything we're told, but the lies that they spin are sort of made believable to the ignorant masses because they're never given the proper language. They're given words. They're translating the scriptures backwards so that you'll end up believing a backwards idea of the truth. So it continues. This is the word heathen is found more than 140 times in the King James Version of the Bible. Through the years, heathen has lost its original biblical meaning of not Jewish. And that's not what it means either. It has nothing to do with being Jewish. It has to do with being of a certain tribe, Judean Anyone who was the Goyim or up in Japheth or up in Europe, they were the, they were not Jewish. They were the heathen or a specific tribe of Japheth. So not only has the, 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 the translators lost the meaning, but modern, uh, interpreters are hiding the meaning further. So today it means an unbeliever or a pagan or someone who worships other gods, I guess is what they're saying. And yet it's completely the opposite because in Christianity there was the Father, the Mother, and the Son, and ye are all deities. And the Father has many deities. And there are the seven angels, which is El, and heaven, heavenly Els, or the Elohim. So there are many of these Elohim. So, this is very, very, very concerning. And I wish that I could, I had the time to translate the Bible correctly. I really do wish that, that I had the time to do that. It would take me probably at least a year or two to do something like that. And I wouldn't have time to make these videos or anything else. But for whatever reason, the world has come down, the, the, the truth has, has been obscured and hidden all the way until the very end of time, which is where we're at. The Bible says the good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness, all the nations, all the pagans, you know. But in that sense, um, it's probably talking about literally all the nations or peoples because in that sense, that Greek word, all the nations, well, that word means oikonimi, which the original Greek word there, and it means the whole earth. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't mean the Europe, specifically, or any other nation. And the word has nothing to do with pagans or idolaters or people who don't believe in the Lord or anything like that. It means the entire world. So where the Bible says the good news is going to be preached, it tells you in the entire world. Why? Because that's where all of the Israelites, all 12 tribes, the 10 tribes that are lost are the nations. And they are going to go east, west, north, and south, scattered like seed. And in Hosea it says, And where it was said, You're not my children, there it shall be said, You're the children of the living, the living deity. That's the same deity in the New Testament where Jesus asked Peter, Who am I? And he said, You are the son of the living deity, not Jehovah. So in the Old Testament, it does speak of the living deity, the real one. And it's called, sometimes they, they use a specific title of Most High. Sometimes they use the title Almighty. And there are times when Jehovah attributes that title to himself. Jehovah has, there are verses that say, Jehovah says, I am the Most High. I mean, there are verses that says, where Jehovah says, I am the only deity, but that's not true. He's not the only deity. In fact, he sent Jesus to hell for claiming to be 
like the Father, as it says in Isaiah 14. And there, Yahweh sends the Lucifer, the shining one, the son of the morning, son of the dawn, the light bearer, who was Jesus, to hell, proclaiming to be like the Most High. See, neither Yahweh nor Jesus is the Most High. But Yahweh was mad at Jesus for saying he was like the Most High and sent him to hell for it because he accused him under law. He said, you broke my law because this is his kingdom. Well, where's Jesus' kingdom? Well, Jesus, my kingdom is no part of this world. So all of this is being obfuscated. All of this is being hidden from us because of these mistranslations, these concepts that are not being shared with us because the translation is so false. So, now we're going to get to the good stuff. So, we're the pagans. The gospel was sent unto the pagans. The Judeans rejected the gospel. And Jesus said, your house, your house is desolate. It's left unto you desolate. That temple of yours, your religion, it's gone. Not one stone shall be left upon a stone. Jesus said, I am taking away the kingdom from you and I'm giving to a people that's producing its fruit. Who? Well, he said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. But he also said, go unto the only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's it. So Jesus said, I'm going to give the kingdom to another people who are also Israelites. Now, we talked about that the other day. Judah had two sons, Zerah and Perez. The people in Palestine had a line of Judah from Perez, but there was another line from Zerah. It had a, a, a crimson ribbon or a red ribbon that they tied around its hand because it came out first. And then it pulled back in and the other one came out. So there would be a breach that was called the breach. There are two lines, royal lines. We, we trace the Zara line to Troy and then to Ireland and then Scotland and England. And that line rules the world today, not the one from Christ, not the one in Palestine. So there are the two and there's a breach and there's a bunch of prophecies that deal with this. But we're talking about pagans or the nations and we've said that Europe is really where the Isles of the Sea were, the, were the, the, the lands where the nations were existing. And they were the Goyim. So Paul went to the Goyim. He went up there to preach and he said, you are the children of Israel, a royal priesthood. You are our, he says, our fathers were baptized into Moses. Why? Because up there in Galatia where he was talking, they were the children of Israel. We've got the Apostle Peter saying in the first Peter chapter one, verse one, he starts naming all these people up there in Antolia or Turkey or uh, the Aegean area, the Greece, Grecian area. And he was naming all these people and says, you are the dispora, the holy nation, the holy right. And Paul is saying, we were baptized into Moses. You're a holy nation. So you're the true Israel. The gospel would go unto the Jews and also to the Greeks. Where are the Greeks? Up there in this area, Asia Minor, Antolia, the Aegean Sea, up to Italy as well, because one of the children of Dardanus, which was a child of Judah, made Troy, and then one of his children was Annius, who ended up giving birth to Romulus, which made the Romans. But then, then they also, as we said, were the Tuatha de Danans that went up into Ireland. So this is the other line of Judah that's prophesied in the Bible that one day would come together with the other and heal that breach. But when they went to Troy, right after that was what? Way back when, about 1300 BC. So from that point on down, we're going to find to is about 1000. For about 300 years, they had some sort of religious beliefs. They had some mysteries, some teachings. They had uh, uh, the Acropolis. They had um, 
these ancient mysteries. Pythagoras went down and studied in the, the illusion mystery schools and also went down into Egypt and studied under the, the Pharaonic priests and went to India and studied there and went to Persia, the Zoroastrian uh, teachings and studied those teachings. Well, we know that for many years, like a thousand or, or more years, these mysteries called the Eleusinian mysteries were being practiced there. We know that the children that practiced those were of Israel. So, I want to read you a little bit about these Eleusinian mysteries. It says the Eleus Eleusinian mysteries were initiations held every year for the cult of Demeter and Persephone, based on the Panhellenic sanctuary of Eleusis in ancient Greece. Eleusis in ancient Greece. They are the most famous of the secret religious rites of ancient Greece. Their basis was an old agrarian cult. And there is some evidence that they were derived from the religious practices of the Mycenaean period. What is that? Well, let's click on that and see what they're saying. The Mycenaean Greece was the last phase of the Bronze Age in ancient Greece, spanning the period from approximately 1750 to 1050 BC. So somewhere around 1000 BC is when it stopped. Okay, it ended. Why did it end? Well, because after that time, it became known, because even in the days of Christ, there was these Eleusinian mysteries. But this was where it originated. So it had to have started up again sometime after 1000 BC, very shortly thereafter, because we know that it was pretty much continuous that this, these mysteries were taught. But somewhere around 900 BC, the illusion mystery started up again in that form, and came all the way down into the days of Christ. So, who could it have been? What was this religion? The Bible actually tells us. What does this word, Eleusinian mysteries, what does it mean? Well, it comes from this word you see there, Eleusis. What is that? You go down here a little further, and it says etymology. Illusion mysteries. It says, the name of the city Eleusis is pre-Greek and may be related with the name of the goddess Elithia. Remember the prophet Elisha? Or Elijah? And after him came Elisha the prophet that had double a portion of Elijah? Well, after Elijah, Elisha took over the reins and became this great prophet. But who were these people that followed Elisha. I want to show you something here. We look up Elijah on the Goggle Brothers and it says he was born around 900 BC. That's pretty accurate because King David was around 1000 BC and Solomon came after that just shortly. So that was right around the time of King Solomon and King David and then there was Elijah shortly thereafter. So Elijah did something, but what did he do? Well, the story is that Judea had apostatized. They had become apostates. And they were, you know, they had killed all the prophets and, 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 they, and they didn't know what to do. And they said that there was a famine. There was a famine in the world so bad that, that the whole country, I guess, was starving. And Elijah was wandering around looking for food. All the people in the world were running around looking for food. It was so bad of a famine. And Elijah went out into the wilderness and they were trying to hunt him down to kill him because it was such apostasy in Judea. Well, Elijah ended up going north to Syria and he found this widow who had a child that dies and Elijah raises the child up, the widow's son. The widow was from Zarephath, and that was up in Syria. That woman, being a widow, is a symbol of something. It has to do with these Eleusinian mysteries. Because the woman who 
died in the Bible died because of a famine. That's exactly what we find that created the Eleusinian mysteries. They were about a famine, a deity who was starving and the gods had to do something about it and this is what started the Elysian Mysteries. They, they miraculously gave them bread. Well, it's spiritual bread. It was religious teaching, spiritual food. And the widow's son then would be the raising up of a priesthood to power because Elijah was the head of all of the priests of the world. So Elijah had been anointed by the divine father had gotten uh, a revelation on Mount Horeb and had these great mysteries. And after he got these great mysteries, he went and raised the widow's son from Syria. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, he looked at them and said, Your father's the devil. Who do you think you are? I'm taking the kingdom from you, this child of Judah. And I'm going to give it to another child. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Jesus said, Do you not understand the scriptures? Were there no widows in Israel? When Elijah raised the widow's son from Syria? I mean, Elijah was starving to death. It was a spiritual famine. He had no truth. He couldn't get any truth out of Judea. You people have no truth. You're a liar. You're following the devil. See, there was no widow in Israel worthy of raising up her son. The woman, Paul says, was uh, corresponding to Hagar, who was in bondage with her children. That woman was left to die. Judean was gone at that point. Elijah then turned his attention to Syria and raised up their child, their priesthood, and brought that to power. This is why the Masonic societies are always talking about there is no help for the widow's son. They're always talking about secret mysteries that they never explain to anybody. These things I'm telling you, this is not probably been told to the world. It's been hidden from the world, well, since the days of Jesus. But this is a mystery that I'm going to show you right now. Hold on. Watch this. So what were these mysteries? We know that they got started right around the same time that Elijah raised the widow's son. The mysteries are, and, and that Eleusis can be enunciated as Elisha or Elijah. Either I'm not sure whether it would be Elijah or Elisha because the Bible talks about Elijah and then when he went into the heaven on the fiery chariot, he his mantle fell off of his body and Elisha got his mantle and got two parts his power, double his power. So Elisha carried on the mysteries. The way they're spelling it here, it sounds like Elisha. So the Elishian mysteries, really. But what were they? Well, it says they were initiations that were held every year for the cult of Demeter and Persephone based on the Panhellenic sanctuary of Eleusis or Elysis, ancient Greece. The rites, ceremonies, and beliefs were kept secret and consistently preserved from antiquity. For the initiated, the rebirth of Persephone symbolized the eternity of life which flows from generation to generation and they believed that they would have a reward in the afterlife. There were many paintings and places of pottery that depict various aspects of the mysteries, since the mysteries involved visions and conjuring of an afterlife. Some scholars believe that the power and longevity of the Illusionian mysteries, a consistent set of rites, ceremonies, and experiences that span two millennia, came from the psychedelic drugs. Amanita, muscaria, guys, and the daffodil are two of the drugs that they use. The name of the town, Eleusis, seems to be pre-Greek and is likely a counterpart with Elysium and the goddess of Elythia. The ancient Greek word whence English mystery derives means mystery or secret rite and is related with the verb maya, which means to teach, initiate into the mysteries. And the noun mystis, which means one initiated, the word mystikos, whence English mystic means connected with the mysteries or private secret. So, you see, we were talking about how Paul was on the road to Damascus going up to that area in Asia Minor around the Aegean Sea. And 
He says, after three years, he heard these words which were unlawful for a man to speak. He was initiated. The Essene mysteries, they initiated you for three years. That we, we learn from Josephus and Pliny. So we know that Paul was initiated into the mysteries of the Essenes. We know that the, the temple of Artemis, their priests were called Essenes. It is spelled exactly the same way. They were the same priests. Well, there were many Essene priests all over that then known world. Many of them were down at the Dead Sea. But listen to this. This gets even better. So we go down here. It says, Some scholars argue that the Eleusinian cult was a continuation of the Minoan cult and that Demeter was a poppy goddess. Poppy? That's opium. A poppy goddess who brought the poppy from Crete to Eleusis. Some useful information from the Mycenaean period can be taken from the study of the cult of Desponia. Remember, Elijah was given a little bread from this widow who had just a little bit of dough, or a little bit of flour, I guess, and a little bit of oil, just enough to make one little round cake, just enough for her and her son, and then they were going to die. And Elijah told her to, to make him a cake first, and that 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 flour would never be depleted. It would continue. It would, it would be an endless supply of food. You see, that is something that we hear over and over again with these Amanita mushrooms. Kind of like sourdough bread. You, it, you would just continually use it every time you made another batch. It was endless. So anyway, we, we won't get into too much of that in this. I just want to point out what these mysteries were. So, um... The poppy goddess who brought the poppy from Crete. Some useful information from the Mycenaean period can be taken from the study of the cult of Desponia, the precursor goddess of Persephone, and the cult of Elithia, who was the goddess of childbirth. The Megaron of Desponia at Lycosura is quite similar to the Telesterian of the Eleusis. The Demeter is united with the god Poseidon, bearing a daughter the unnameable Desponia, the mistress. And in the cave of Amniosis at Crete, the goddess Elithia is related with the annual birth of the divine child. The myth was represented in a cycle with three phases, the descent, the search, and the ascent, with contrasting emotions from sorrow to joy, which roused the mystery to exaltation. The main theme was the ascent of Persephone and the reunion with her mother Demeter. At the beginning of the feast, the priests filled two special vessels and poured them out, one towards the west, the other towards the east, and people looking both to the sky and to the earth shouting the magical rain, rain, rain and conceive. Remember, what Elijah did was he prayed that it might rain after it hadn't rained, right? It, it hadn't rained for three and a half years, and he prayed that it would rain, and it rained. So it was some ceremony that Elijah did to make it rain. So it says, uh, the people looking both to the sky and to the earth shouted a magical rhyme, reign and conceive. In a ritual, a child was initiated from the hearth, the divine fire. Remember, uh, Elijah had something to do with bringing fire down from heaven? Well, the name Pace, or child, appears in the Mycenaean inscriptions. It was the ritual of the divine child, who originally was Plutos. In the Homeric him, the ritual is connected with the myth of the agricultural god Triptolemus. The goddess of nature survived in the mysteries where the following words were uttered. Mighty Potenia bore a great son. You see, this woman, Mother Nature, was a widow because it was a famine. And her husband had already died. And now her only son, to continue on the, the, the mysteries, was about to die as well because it was a famine. So somebody came along in some sort of ritual and threw some sort of fire and some rain dance and made it rain and brought Plutus back to life, the widow's son. Friends, the Illusion Mysteries started around 900 BC, which is when Elijah raised the widow's son. It is the true mysteries. Oh my goodness. Well, that is certainly eye-opening and explains so much, friends. And we're going to keep plowing this field until this crop of truth grows 
and the whole world gets to share in the bounty. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and go and leave it there because we're just, you know, getting down to where close to an hour and I want to try to make these videos or, you know, these um, podcasts just a little shorter because I know a lot of your got busy schedules and you you got things to do. So we'll go ahead and get back at you tomorrow. Have a good one.